Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Live Long and Protest, W.E.B. Du Bois, 1920-1963. When the quintessential African-American scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois turned 70 in the year 1938, he decided to write an autobiography. The resulting work, Dusk of Dawn, appeared in 1940 with the striking, if also puzzling, subtitle, An Essay Toward an Autobiography of a Race Concept. The book opens with an apology rather than a preface. It illuminates the implication of the subtitle. We are not about to read his life story exactly, but the story of the idea of race. He writes, My life had its significance, and its only deep significance, because it was part of a problem. But that problem was, as I continued to think, the central problem of the greatest of the world's democracies, and so the problem of the future world. Back in 1900, at the age of 32, he had predicted that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. Some four decades later, he felt ready to explore this problem through the unique prism of his life story, saying in the Apology, I seem to see a way of elucidating the inner meaning and significance of that race problem by explaining it in terms of the one human life that I know best. He assumed that that life was drawing to a close. At the very end of the book, he records remarks he offered at the public celebration of his 70th birthday, including the serene boast, I have never shared what seems to me the essentially childish desire to live forever. As it turned out, though, Du Bois came closer to living forever than most people do. When 1957 rolled around, he began work on another autobiography, 17 years after the publication of Dusk of Dawn. He completed a manuscript over the next couple of years before his move to Ghana in 1961 and his death in 1963. A Russian translation was published while he was still alive, but it was not until 1968, the year of the centenary of his birth, that this final book of his was published in English, with the main title, The Autobiography of W.E.B. Du Bois. Again, there was a striking subtitle, a soliloquy on viewing my life from the last decade of its first century. That may sound like Du Bois was beginning to be more optimistic about achieving immortality, but in the book's opening chapter, Du Bois accurately predicts that he will not reach a full hundred years, since life seldom goes by logical completeness. Still, he felt near enough at that point to speak with a certain unity. It is time for us, too, to speak with a certain unity. Du Bois has come up at least in passing and often enough in a prominent role in every scripted episode of this series of podcasts since our first episode focusing on him, which was episode 66. In episode 68, we featured him throughout the episode, covering many of the important events of his life from 1900 to his death in 1963, as a useful way of introducing the general topic of Africana philosophy in the 20th century. In today's episode, we will especially highlight his 1920 book, Dark Water, and 1940's Dusk of Dawn. This is not to say that he will go unmentioned in future episodes, he was a monumentally influential figure, and other Africana thinkers continued to react to him, take inspiration from him, and on occasion criticize him. His status as a major thinker was, of course, first secured with his 1903 classic, The Souls of Black Folk. In the Apology, in Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois identifies the souls of Black Folk, Dark Water, and Dusk of Dawn itself as a trio of similar efforts. I have essayed in a half-century three sets of thought centering around the hurts and hesitancies that hem the black man in America. As sets of thought, these books may be seen as distinctive. They do not fall neatly into the categories of history, sociology, and fiction, like most of the other books he published before 1940. For those who are interested in Du Bois as a philosopher, these three books are the most important ones to read. Continuing to describe the trio in the Apology, Du Bois refers to the souls of black folk as a cry at midnight thick within the veil. We have already explored much of what is important about souls of black folk, as this is where we found the notion of double consciousness and his criticism of Booker T. Washington. His characterization of dark water is very different. He calls it an exposition and militant challenge, defiant with dogged hope. There is indeed a confrontational militancy that marks the 1920 book as different from its 1903 predecessor, 
if it is defiant, it is in part by defying expectations with regard to genre and structure. It is a collection of essays, but interspersed between these essays are short stories and poems, resulting in a unique balance of discursive prose with creative writing. The themes of the book vary widely, but some trends emerge. In the essays, a dominant theme is the promotion of egalitarianism, with Du Bois showing a strong commitment to equality of cross lines of difference in a number of different spheres of social life. Naturally, one of the forms of equality he presses readers to recognize is racial equality. This idea comes to the forefront in an essay called The Souls of White Folk, a title that obviously plays on the title of his earlier book. One wonders what it might have been like if he'd continued the pattern and given us the souls of Filipino folk, the souls of Arab folk, and so on. The essay seeks to pierce the myth of white superiority and reveal behind it the spectacular ugliness of European colonial domination. It also reminds us that so-called white people are, after all, mere humans, and like all humans have the capacity for both great accomplishment and great evil. When discussing Du Bois's 1897 essay, The Conservation of Races, we saw that he was a pioneering figure with respect to the now common view that race is fundamentally a social rather than biological form of group difference. This way of thinking about race comes through still more boldly in The Souls of White Folk, where Du Bois claims, The discovery of personal whiteness among the world's peoples is a very modern thing, a 19th and 20th century matter indeed. Alongside the expected theme of racial egalitarianism, the Du Bois of Darkwater turns out to be remarkably committed to egalitarianism in economics, politics, and gender. Of Work and Wealth is the essay that most clearly reveals his turn to a socialist view of economics. Du Bois argues that, just as ownership of laborers was eventually recognized as unnecessary and wrong in the case of slavery, the private ownership of land, tools, and raw materials should be challenged and ultimately eradicated. With regard to politics, Du Bois reflects deeply on the value of democracy in the essay entitled Of the Ruling of Men. It contrasts sharply with the aristocratic elitism of his 1903 essay, The Talented Tenth. Early on in the essay, he identifies ignorance as the major challenge for democracies. When even the most intelligent and well-educated part of the population has only limited knowledge about a limited number of things, how do we justify placing power in the hands of the masses, among whom outright ignorance is so widespread. Du Bois responds that the problem of ignorant voters should not cause us to restrict who can vote. Rather, it should encourage us to offer all citizens the best education possible. He then further turns the problem of ignorance on its head by arguing that you know yourself better than anyone else can know you. This means that any restriction on political participation necessarily deprives society of relevant knowledge, as Du Bois puts it with his usual eloquence, the vast and wonderful knowledge of this marvelous universe is locked in the bosoms of its individual souls. To tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and deed, we must appeal not to the few, not to some souls, but to all. Unfortunately, Du Bois does not stop to tell us how we should relate this position to his earlier thoughts on the cultivation of an educated African-American elite. When writing The Talented Tenth, he did not hesitate to use the term aristocracy positively, posing the rhetorical question, can the masses of the Negro people be in any possible way more quickly raised than by the effort and example of this aristocracy of talent and character? Was there ever a nation on God's fair earth civilized from the bottom upward? In Of the Ruling of Men, by contrast, he argues that aristocracies are bound to be substandard in comparison to democracies. This is not because of corruption among elites, as many would suspect, but because the best and most effective aristocracy, like the best monarchy, suffered from lack of knowledge. These remarkable pieces notwithstanding, many see The Damnation of Women as the most outstanding essay in Darkwater. It may take a place alongside works like John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women as a tour de force of feminist thought by a prominent male philosopher. Du Bois points to the inequality involved in the fact that motherhood generally comes at the expense of education and a career. If this is how women are damned, then here is his proposal for their salvation. The future woman must have a life work and economic independence. She must have knowledge. She must have the right of motherhood at her own discretion. The present mincing horror at free womanhood must pass if we are ever to be rid of the bestiality of free manhood. 
As so often, Du Bois speaks to the controversies that are still ongoing today, in this case over reproductive rights in the United States. He staunchly defends a woman's right to motherhood at her own discretion. As the essay goes on, Du Bois focuses on the specific history, challenges, and conditions of black womanhood. As he explains in the essay's final paragraph, he aims to pay tribute to black women's resilience in the face of all they have suffered. In the course of doing this, he quotes Anna Julia Cooper's most famous sentence, only the black woman can say, when and where I enter, in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood, without violence and without suing or special patronage, then and there, the whole Negro race enters with me. Disappointingly, Du Bois quotes this line without naming Cooper, contenting himself with the anonymizing words, as one of our women writes. This proprietary phrase, as Joy James has called it, makes the omission of her name even worse. Cooper's individuality is erased, and Du Bois implicitly asserts paternalistic male dominance, even as he is contributing what is, in many other ways, a stellar and forward-looking work of feminist thought. Why would he do this? Without denying the sexism of the passage, it's worth remembering that Du Bois had a nasty habit of failing to acknowledge men, too. We pointed out in episode 68 that Du Bois called the 1919 conference he organized the first Pan-African Congress, even though he had attended and played a key role at the first Pan-African Conference back in 1900, organized by Henry Sylvester Williams. Williams is seldom mentioned in Du Bois' writings. By the way, Cooper attended that conference in 1900 too. It was a notable gathering of representatives from around the black world whose names would go down in history with no thanks to Du Bois. Before we move on from discussing Darkwater, we should touch on the pieces of creative writing interspersed between the book's essays. Their main motif is religious language and imagery, as every one of the seven poems and four short stories involves some sort of reference to the divine. Falling outside the pattern is The Comet, a provocative tale of a black man and a white woman who survive a comet's lethal impact on New York City. It has been celebrated as a pioneering work of Africana science fiction and is well worth reading. Du Bois designates it as being somehow distinct from the other creative pieces in the book. Unlike them, it is a numbered chapter, like the essays, and it does not foreground religious language and imagery. The book's first creative piece is Credo, a poetic set of statements of belief, similar in form to the Apostles' Creed. It was powerful and concise enough to be printed in a poster format. In this form, it hung on the walls of many black homes after Du Bois first published it in 1904 in a magazine called the Independent. Its first sentence reads, I believe in God, who made of one blood all nations that on earth do dwell. This from the same Du Bois who refused to lead a prayer at Wilberforce University. The statement looks like a straightforward expression of theistic Christian faith, adapting as it does Paul's description of God to the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17.26. Yet one might see the religious content of the credo as a metaphorical way to present its moral and political message. Consider its reference to Jesus. I believe in the Prince of Peace. I believe that war is murder. I believe that armies and navies are at bottom the tinsel and braggadocio of oppression and wrong, and I believe that the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations by nations whiter and stronger, but foreshadows the death of that strength. Du Bois is more interested in the pacifist implications of Christianity than anything more substantially theological. The tension between apparently religious form and apparently non-religious content is also present in Du Bois's heartbreaking poem, A Litany at Atlanta. It was first published in The Independent in October of 1906, after a race riot in Atlanta the previous month. A rampage by a white mob had killed at least 25 black people, injured many more, and damaged many black businesses. Du Bois' poem is addressed to God, and uses the call-and-response format of a traditional litany. Yet, from the very first line, God is identified as silent. This prayer of petition seeks to understand why there can be evil, such as was done in Atlanta. At one point, the question is raised whether God is dead. Though Du Bois shies away from this initial flirtation with atheism, the alternative appears to be imagining God as distant, as far removed from the activities of humans here on Earth. Du Bois also poses the question whether God could be white, prefiguring the investigation of the problem of evil in the professional philosopher William R. Jones's 1973 book, Is God a White Racist? 
a preamble to black theology. By the end, the prayer addresses a god of a godless land, provoking the thought, wouldn't that be no god at all? Why, though, would Du Bois draw the reader toward serious consideration of agnosticism, if not atheism, in the traditional language of the church? More generally, why is he so attracted to the use of religious language and imagery? Possibly he separates the truth of religious claims from the aesthetic and ethical power of their language and imagery. For the artist who wishes to communicate ethical and political messages, such language is useful, if not indispensable, as an instrument. Between Dark Water and Dusk of Dawn lie a couple of decades of work by Du Bois from 1920 to 1940. His book The Gift of Black Folk, yet another play on the title of The Souls of Black Folk, was published in 1924 as part of a series of books on the contributions of ethnic minorities to the United States, commissioned by the Knights of Columbus. The other two books that appeared in this series were entitled The Jews in the Making of America and The Germans in the Making of America. The subtitle of Du Bois's book was thus The Negroes in the Making of America. It duly covers the topics of black explorers, black labor, black soldiers, black pursuit of freedom, the experience of black women, black art, and the black spirit. Another important work of the 1920s is his 1926 essay, Criteria of Negro Art, which we have discussed previously. And speaking of art, his 1928 novel, Dark Princess, is among his most interesting reflections on solidarity among non-white peoples in the face of white supremacy. Central to the story is a love affair between an African-American man and a princess from India. The princess is involved in a plot alongside co-conspirators from other parts of the non-white world. Arabs and East Asians, to end white dominance of the globe. A major issue in the novel is the question of how those not long removed from slavery can contribute to such a global struggle. The early 1930s featured one of Du Bois's most controversial changes of mind. In a series of editorials in The Crisis, the official journal of the NAACP, Du Bois began to argue that African Americans should not focus on fighting segregation, pure and simple. The target should be discrimination, not separation, and some of the energy spent fighting segregation would be better spent on black self-organization. In the long run, human development is best served by contact across lines of difference, so segregation must die if humanity is truly to flourish. In the short term, though, the priority should be the achievement of economic emancipation through voluntary, determined, cooperative effort. This new stance put him in conflict with the organization he had helped to found, the NAACP, and he resigned from his editorship of the crisis and his position on the board of the organization. Back at Atlanta University, he published what some see as his greatest work, and certainly his greatest work as a historian, Black Reconstruction in America. Here he sought to replace the dominant and utterly racist school of thought among professional historians concerning the time period following the Civil War. This view painted Reconstruction as a terrible time during which the South was subject to military occupation and corrupt rule by state governments, which included inept former slaves. Du Bois, by contrast, showed how much was accomplished during the attempt at democracy during Reconstruction, such as the establishment of a system of public education. The book displays the growing influence of Marxism on Du Bois, most famously in his treatment of enslaved African Americans as a revolutionary proletariat who helped to end slavery through a general strike. But let's move on to Dusk of Dawn, which, like Dark Water, is too often neglected in favor of the earlier souls of black folk. Having described souls as a cry at midnight, and Dark Water as hopeful and militant challenge, he writes of his initial idea for another book. This, the third book, started to record dimly but consciously that subtle sense of coming day which one feels of early mornings, even when mist and murk hang low. The contradiction of the title suggests that, on the one hand, Du Bois sees a coming end to the dark night of hopelessness engendered by the system of Jim Crow. In the dawning light, he can discern a path to freedom and equality. On the other hand, we are still at dusk. Much remains hazy, obscure, and even contradictory about that way forward. Dusk of dawn is therefore a reflection on how to proceed in a situation both promising and confusing. In this twilight, we must hope that the sun is rising, not setting. The book is, however, also an autobiography. Its first chapter, The Plot, exemplifies the book's combination of Du Bois's personal development 
with an interest in illuminating the meaning of race in world history. It offers a summary of his changing thoughts about race, framed by broader developments in thought and politics. Chapters 2 through 4 begin recounting the story of his life, from his birth in 1868 to the formation of the NAACP in 1909. Chapters 5 to 7 then interrupt the story, a substantial digression that makes up no less than a third of the book. At the beginning of this section, Du Bois writes, I want now to turn aside from the personal annals of this biography to consider the conception which is, after all, my main subject. Finally, he resumes the story of his life from 1910 to the time of writing. Actually, we have to apologize for calling the middle part a digression, because Du Bois himself says, My discussions of the concept of race and of the white and colored worlds are not to be regarded as digressions from the history of my life. Rather, my autobiography is a digressive illustration and exemplification of what race has meant in the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. So if anything, it is the autobiographical chapters that are tangential to the central material of chapters 5, 6, and 7. Chapter 5, The Concept of Race, has gained a lot of attention. Du Bois explores his ancestry, contrasting the identifiable European ancestry on his father's side to his lack of knowledge as to his most recent ancestor to live in Africa on that side. His connection to Africa on his mother's side is reasonably well established, as we know that his great-great-grandfather, Tom Burghardt, was born in Africa. Culturally, however, his mother's family was representative of New England, where they had been for generations. Du Bois eventually quotes Heritage by County Cullen, one of the great poets of the Harlem Renaissance, and for a short time Du Bois' son-in-law. Cullen famously asks in his poem, What is Africa to me? Du Bois echoes this question and admits that his tie to Africa is something he can feel better than explain. The mark of African heritage is there in skin color and hair, but science has not shown that these physical differences are of any deep significance. He finally concludes, but one thing is sure, and that is the fact that since the 15th century, these ancestors of mine and their other descendants have had a common history, have suffered a common disaster, and have one long memory. The actual ties of heritage between the individuals of this group vary with the ancestors that they have in common and many others, Europeans and Semites, perhaps Mongolians, certainly American Indians. But the physical bond is least, and the badge of color relatively unimportant, save as a badge. The real essence of this kinship is its social heritage of slavery, the discrimination and insult, and this heritage binds together not simply the children of Africa, but extends through yellow Asia and into the South Seas. It is this unity that draws me to Africa. Again, Du Bois here depicts race as a social phenomenon. It has to do with the interaction of people over time, not with what is in their blood. The passage has been criticized as a glorious non sequitur, by Kwame Anthony Appiah. Du Bois tells us that being a victim of discrimination and insult is something Asians and the peoples of the Pacific Islands share with Africans. So why would this unity draw him specifically to Africa? As Appiah puts it, how can something he shares with the whole non-white world bind him to only a part of it? While Du Bois tells us that physical features are unimportant, Appiah concludes that these superficial similarities must still explain Du Bois' sense of attachment. In response, we might interpret Du Bois as acknowledging that European imperialism historically gave rise to various racial categories. That these groups shared a common experience does not preclude his belonging to just one of them, or his feeling culturally invested in that group. Pride in African ancestry could thus be a valid way to resist the history of anti-Black oppression. Throughout the 1940s, Du Bois continued to rethink his views on race, politics, and culture. Later on in the decade, he gave a speech called the Talented Tenth Memorial Address, delivered to the black professional fraternity Sigma Pi Phi in 1948. Du Bois is here self-critical, admitting that the ideal of the Talented Tenth as he formulated it initially, envisioning an educated elite uplifting the race as a whole, was overly optimistic. I assumed that with knowledge, sacrifice would automatically follow. In my youth and idealism, I did not realize that selfishness is even more natural than sacrifice. Some, like Joy James, have understood Du Bois to be completely repudiating his old ideal in this speech. Yet Du Bois proposes to do something different, to re-examine and restate the thesis of the Talented Tenth, which I laid down many years ago. 
By the end of the address, he advocates a new idea of the talented tenth, the concept of a group of leadership, not simply educated and self-sacrificing, but with clear vision of present world conditions and dangers and conducting American Negroes to alliance with culture groups in Europe, America, Asia, and Africa, and looking toward a new world culture. Given his now long-standing socialist turn, this vision will, of course, include an anti-capitalist outlook. We have seen that this socialist turn brought with it a strong commitment to egalitarianism, but Du Bois does not seem to have given up completely on his earlier elitism. He refers to this newly idealized group not as the talented tenth, but as the guiding hundredth. This anti-capitalist vanguard should help lead the way forward for African Americans and through them, the world. Just as Dusk of Dawn came two decades after Darkwater, the last writing of Du Bois we will mention in this episode came two decades after Dusk of Dawn. Du Bois delivered Whither, Now, and Why to a conference of black social science teachers. By this time, he recognized that legal equality for African Americans was coming, indeed more swiftly than he had ever imagined. But this did not mean that the difficulties of black life would end. On the contrary, he told his audience, what we now must ask ourselves is, when we become equal American citizens, what will be our aims and ideals? Are we to assume that we will simply adopt the ideals of Americans and become what they are or want to be, and that we will have in this process no ideals of our own? That would mean that we would cease to be Negroes as such and become white in action, if not completely in color. We would take on the culture of white Americans doing as they do and thinking as they think. For Du Bois, such an outcome would be clearly unsatisfactory. He explains that his goal has never been to settle the question of racial equality in America by the process of getting rid of the Negro race, but that he's rather always aimed at securing the possibility of black folk and their cultural patterns existing in America without discrimination and on terms of equality. Insofar as whither now and why is about preserving and cultivating black cultural difference, it can be usefully seen as a sequel to The Conservation of Races, written 63 years earlier. His amazing longevity is underscored by the ages at which he delivered these two speeches, the conservation of races at 29, with her now and why at 92. Du Bois gave us much to think about over the course of his long life, and we have managed only to highlight a small portion of his work in this episode. It is only right then that we take the time to highlight his genius a bit more with an interview. We'll be talking with Liam Kofi Bright, about a topic we have so far discussed only in passing, Du Bois's philosophy of science, and in particular the question of whether political priorities should affect scientific inquiry. It would be a bright idea for you to join us for that next time here on The History of Africana Philosophy. <laughs>